Egypt was conquered by the Ottoman Empire in 1517, following the Ottoman Mamluk War, 1516-1517, and the absorption of Syria into the empire in 1516. Egypt was administrated as an ally of the Ottoman Empire, Ottoman Turkish, semicolon ally from 1517 until 1867, with an interruption during the French occupation of 1798-1801. Egypt was always a difficult province for the Ottoman sultans to control, due in part to the continuing power and influence of the Mamluks, the Egyptian military caste who had ruled the country for centuries. As such, Egypt remained semi-autonomous under the Mamluks until it was invaded by the French forces of Napoleon I in 1798. After the French were expelled, power was seized in 1805 by Muhammad Ali Pasha, an Albanian military commander of the Ottoman army in Egypt. Egypt under the Muhammad Ali dynasty remained nominally an Ottoman province. It was granted the status of an autonomous vassal state or Kedavid in 1867. Ismail and Ufuk Pasha governed Egypt as a quasi-independent state under Ottoman suzerainty until the British occupation of 1882. Nevertheless, the Kedavid of Egypt, 1867 to 1914, remained a de jure Ottoman province until the 5th of November 1914, when it was declared a British protectorate in reaction to the decision of the Young Turks of the Ottoman Empire to join the First World War on the side of the Central Powers. After the conquest of Egypt, the Ottoman Sultan Selim I left the country. Grand Vizier Yunus Pasha was awarded the governorship of Egypt. However. The Sultan soon discovered that Yunus Pasha had created an extortion and bribery syndicate, and gave the office to Hay Bey, the former Mamluk governor of Aleppo, who had contributed to the Ottoman victory at the Battle of Majdabek. The history of early Ottoman Egypt is a competition for power between the Mamluks and the representatives of the Ottoman Sultan. The register by which a great portion of the land was a fief of the Mamluks was left unchanged allowing the Mamluks to quickly return to positions of great influence. The Mamluk emirs were to be retained in office as heads of twelve Sanjaks, into which Egypt was divided, and under the next Sultan, Suleiman I, two chambers were created, called the Greater Divan and Lesser Divan, in which both the army and the ecclesiastical authorities were represented. To aid the Pasha by their deliberations, six regiments were constituted by the conqueror Selim for the protection of Egypt, to those Suleiman added a seventh, of Sir Carson's. It was the practice of the sublime Porti to change the governor of Egypt at very short intervals, after a year or less. The fourth governor, Hain Ahmed Pasha, hearing that orders for his execution had come from Constantinople, endeavoured to make himself an independent ruler and had coins struck in his own name. His schemes were frustrated by two of the emirs whom he had imprisoned and who, escaping from their confinement, attacked him in his bath and attempted to kill him. Although Ahmed Pasha escaped wounded, he was soon captured and executed by the Ottoman Sultan's forces. 1527 to 1610 In 1527, the first survey of Egypt under the Ottomans was made, the official copy of the former registers having perished by fire. This new survey did not come into use until 1605. Egyptian lands were divided into four classes, the Sultan's domain, fiefs, land for the maintenance of the army, and lands settled on religious foundations. The constant changes in the government seem to have caused the army to get out of control at an early period of the Ottoman occupation and at the beginning of the 17th century mutinies became common. In 1604, Governor Maktoul Haq Ibrahim Pasha, then known just as Ibrahim Pasha, was murdered by the soldiers, and his head set on the Babzula, earning him the epithet Maktoul, the slain. The reason for these mutinies was the attempt made by successive Pashas to put a stop to the extortion called the Talba a forced payment exacted by the troops from the inhabitants of the country by the fiction of debts requiring to be discharged, which led to grievous usage. In 1609, something like civil war broke out between the army and the Pasha, who had loyal regiments on his side and the Bedouins. The soldiers went so far as to choose a sultan, and to provisionally divide the regions of Cairo between them. They were defeated by the governor Karamemd Pasha who, on February 5, 1610, 
entered Cairo in triumph, executed the ringleaders, and banished others to Yemen, earning him the nickname Kulkran, Slavey Breaker. Historians speak of this event as a second conquest of Egypt for the Ottomans. A great financial reform was then effected by Karim Emd Pasha, who readjusted the burdens imposed on the different communities of Egypt in accordance with their means. 1623 to 1656 With the troubles that beset the metropolis of the Ottoman Empire, the governors appointed thence came to be treated by the Egyptians with continually decreasing respect. In July 1623, an order came from the Porti dismissing Kara Mustafa Pasha, and appointing Sestasi Ali Pasha governor in his place. The officers met the deputy of the newly appointed governor and demanded from him the customary gratuity. When the deputy refused, they sent letters to the Porti declaring that they wished to have Kara Mustafa Pasha and not Sestasi Ali Pasha, as governor. Meanwhile, Sestasi Ali Pasha had arrived at Alexandria and was met by a deputation from Cairo telling him that he was not wanted. He returned a mild answer, when a rejoinder came in the same style as the first message, he had the leader of the deputation arrested and imprisoned. The garrison of Alexandria then attacked the castle and rescued the prisoner. Whereupon Sestasi Ali Pasha was compelled to re-embark on his ship and escape. Shortly thereafter, a rescript arrived from Constantinople confirming Kara Mustafa Pasha in the governorship. Mustafa was succeeded by Bayram Pasha in 1626. Officers in the Ottoman Egyptian army were appointed locally from the various militias, and had strong ties to the Egyptian aristocracy. Thus Ridwan Bey, a Mameluk Emir was able to exercise de facto authority over Egypt from 1631 to 1656. In 1630, Koka Musa Pasha was the newly appointed governor, when the army took it upon themselves to depose him, in indignation at his execution of Kids Bey, an officer who was to have commanded an Egyptian force required for service in Persia. Koka Musa Pasha was given the choice of handing over the executioners to vengeance, or to resigning his place. As he refused to do the former, he was compelled to do the latter. In 1631, a rescript came from Constantinople, approving the conduct of the army and appointing Halil Pasha as Koka Musa Pasha's successor. Not only was the governor unsupported by the Sultan against the troops, but each new governor regularly inflicted a fine upon his outgoing predecessor, under the name of money due to the treasury. The outgoing governor would not be allowed to leave Egypt until he had paid it. Besides the extortions to which this practice gave occasion, the country suffered greatly in these centuries from famine and pestilence. In the spring of 1619, pestilence is said to have killed 635,000 persons and, in 1643, completely desolated 230 villages. Later Ottoman period 1707-1755 By the 18th century, the importance of the Pasha was superseded by that of the Mamluk Bey's two offices, those of Sheikh al-Balad and Amir al-Hajj, which were held by Mamluks, represented the real headship of the community. The process by which this came about is obscure, owing to the want of good chronicles for the Turkish period of Egyptian history. In 1707, the Sheikh al-Balad, Qasim Iwaz, was the head of one of two Mameluk factions, the Qasimites and the Fikharites, between whom the seeds of enmity were sown by the Pasha of the time, with the result that a fight took place between the factions outside Cairo, lasting 80 days. At the end of that time, Qasim Iwaz was killed and the office which he had held was given to his son Ismail. Ismail held this office for 16 years while the Pashas were constantly being changed, and succeeded in reconciling the two factions of Mamelukes. In 1711, an event known to chroniclers as the Great Sedition and the Revolution occurred, when a religious fanatic preacher began to publicly denounce the practice of praying at the graves of Sufi saints, sparking a religious movement that wasn't crushed for three years until 1714. In 1724, Ismail was assassinated through the machinations of the Pasha, and Shirkas Bey, of the opposing faction, was elevated to the office of Sheikh al-Balad in his place. He was soon driven from his post by one of his own faction called Huel Fik R, and fled to Upper Egypt. After a short time, he returned at the head of an army, 
and in the last of the ensuing battles Shirkas Bey met his end by drowning. Huelfakar was himself assassinated in 1730. His place was filled by Uthman Bey, who had served as his general in this war. In 1743, Uthman Bey was forced to fly from Egypt by the intrigues of two adventurers, Ibrahim and Ridwan Bey, who, when their scheme had succeeded, began a massacre of Bey's and others thought to be opposed to them. They proceeded to govern Egypt jointly, holding the offices of Sheikh al-Balad and Amir al-Hajj in alternate years. An attempt by one of the Pashas to remove these two by a coup d'etat failed, owing to the loyalty of the Bey's armed supporters who released Ibrahim and Ridwan from prison and compelled the Pasha to flee to Constantinople. An attempt by a subsequent Pasha, in accordance with secret orders from Constantinople, was so successful that some of the Beys were killed. Ibrahim and Ridwan escaped and compelled the Pasha to resign his governorship and return to Constantinople. Ibrahim was assassinated shortly afterwards by someone who had aspired to occupy one of the vacant bishops which had instead been conferred upon Ali, who, as Ali Bey, was destined to play an important part in the history of Egypt. The murder of Ibrahim Bey took place in 1755, and his colleague Ridwan perished in the subsequent disputes. Ali Bey, who had first distinguished himself by defending a caravan in Arabia against bandits, set himself the task of avenging the death of his former master Ibrahim. He spent eight years in purchasing Mamelukes and winning other adherents, exciting the suspicions of the Sheikh al-Balad Khalil Bey, who organized an attack upon him in the streets of Cairo, in consequence of which he fled to Upper Egypt. Here he met one sailor Bey, who had injuries to avenge upon Khalil Bey, and the two organized a force with which they returned to Cairo and defeated Khalil. Khalil was forced to flee to Eifla, where for a time he concealed himself. Eventually he was discovered, sent to Alexandria, and finally strangled. After Ali Bey's victory in 1750, he was made Sheikh al-Balad. He executed the murderer of his former master Ibrahim, but the resentment which this act aroused among the Beys caused him to leave his post and flee to Syria, where he won the friendship of the governor of Acre, Deir el Omar who obtained for him the goodwill of the Porti and reinstatement in his post as Sheikh al-Balad. In 1766, after the death of his supporter, the Grand Vizier Agib Pasha, he was again compelled to flee from Egypt to Yemen, but in the following year he was told that his party at Cairo was strong enough to permit his return. Resuming his office, he raised 18 of his friends to the rank of Bey, among them Ibrahim and Morad, who were afterwards at the head of affairs, as well as Muhammad Abu al-Dahab who was closely connected with the rest of Ali Bey's career. Ali Bey used very severe measures to repress the brigandage of the Bedouins of Lower Egypt. He endeavored to disband all forces except those which were exclusively under his own control. In 1769, a demand came to Ali Bey for a force of 12,000 men, to be employed by the Porti in the Russo-Turkish War of 1768-1774. It was suggested at Constantinople, however, that Ali would employ this force when he collected it for securing his own independence, and a messenger was sent by the Porti to the Pasha with orders for Ali's execution. Ali, being apprised of the dispatch of this messenger by his agents in Constantinople, ordered that the messenger be waylaid and killed. The dispatches were seized and read by Ali before an assembly of the Beys, who were assured that the order for execution applied to all alike, and he urged them to fight for their lives. His proposals were received with enthusiasm by the Beys whom he had created. Egypt was declared independent, and the Pasha given 48 hours to quit the country. Deir el Omar Pasha of Acre, to whom official information of the step taken by Ali Bey was sent, promised his aid and kept his word by compelling an army sent by the Pasha of Damascus against Egypt to retreat. The Porti was not able to take active measures at the time for the suppression of Ali Bey who endeavoured to consolidate his dominions by sending expeditions against marauding tribes in both North and South Egypt, reforming the finance, and improving the administration of justice. His son-in-law, Abu al-Dahab, was sent to subject the Hor Aura, who had occupied the land between Aswan and Asiat, 
and a force of 20,000 men was sent to conquer Yemen. An officer named Ismail Bey was sent with 8,000 men to acquire the eastern shore of the Red Sea, and Ilayson Bey was sent to occupy Jidda. In six months, the greater part of the Arabian Peninsula was subject to Ali Bey, and he appointed a cousin of his own as Sharalif of Mecca who bestowed on Ali by an official proclamation the titles Sultan of Egypt and Khan of the Two Seas, in 1771. In virtue of this authorization, he then struck coins in his own name and ordered his name to be mentioned in public worship. Abu al-Dahab was sent with a force of 30,000 men in the same year to conquer Syria and agents were sent to negotiate alliances with Venice and Russia. Reinforced by Ali Bey's ally Deir el Omar, Abu al-Dahab easily took the chief cities of Palestine and Syria, ending with Damascus, but at this point he appears to have entered into secret negotiations with the Porti, by which he undertook to restore Egypt to Ottoman suzerainty. He proceeded to evacuate Syria, and marched with all the forces he could collect to Upper Egypt, occupying Asiat in April 1772, having collected additional troops from the Bedouins. He marched on Cairo. Ismail Bey was sent by Ali Bey with a force of 3,000 to check his advance, but Bastan Ismail and his troops joined Abu al-Dahab. Ali Bey intended at first to defend himself as long as possible in the citadel at Cairo, but receiving information that his friend Deir el Omar was still willing to give him refuge, he left Cairo for Syria on the 8th of April 1772, one day before the entrance of Abu al-Dahab at Acre. Ali's fortune seemed to be restored. A Russian vessel anchored outside the port and, in accordance with the agreement which he had made with the Russian Empire, he was supplied with stores, ammunition, and a force of 3,000 Albanians. He sent one of his officers, Ali Bey al-Tantoi, to recover the Syrian towns evacuated by Abu al-Dahab now in the possession of the Porti. He himself took Jaffa and Gaza the former of which he gave to his friend Deir el Omar. On the 1st of February 1773, he received information from Cairo that Abu al-Dahab had made himself Sheikh al-Balad, and in that capacity was practicing unheard of extortions, which were making Egyptians call for the return of Ali Bey. He accordingly started for Egypt at the head of an army of 8,000 men and on 19 April met the army of Abu al-Dahab at Salihiyah. Ali's forces were successful at the first engagement, but when the battle was renewed two days later, he was deserted by some of his officers and prevented by illness and wounds from himself taking the conduct of affairs. The result was a complete defeat for his army, after which he declined to leave his tent. He was captured after a brave resistance and taken to Cairo, where he died seven days later. After Ali Bey's death, Egypt became once more a dependency of the Porti, governed by Abu al-Dahab as Sheikh al-Balad with the title Pasha. He shortly afterwards received permission from the Porti to invade Syria, with a view of punishing Ali Bey's support to Deir el-Omar, and left Ismail Bey and Ibrahim Bey as his deputies in Cairo, who, by deserting Ali at the Battle of Salihiyah, had brought about his downfall. After taking many cities in Palestine, Abu al-Dahab died the cause being unknown, Morad Bey, another of the deserters at Salihiyah, brought his forces back to Egypt on 26 May 1775. Ismail Bey now became Sheikh al-Balad, but was soon involved in a dispute with Ibrahim and Morad, who, after a time, succeeded in driving Ismail out of Egypt and establishing a joint rule similar to that which had been tried previously, as Sheikh al-Balad and Amir al hajj respectively. The two were soon involved in quarrels, which at one time threatened to break out into open war, but this catastrophe was averted and the joint rule was maintained until 1786, when an expedition was sent by the Porti to restore Ottoman supremacy in Egypt. Morad Bey attempted to resist, but was easily defeated. He, with Ibrahim, decided to flee to Upper Egypt and await the trend of events. On 1 August, the Turkish commander Sizay early Ghazi Hassan Pasha entered Cairo, and after violent measures, has been taken for the restoration of order. Ismail Bey was again made Sheikh al-Balad and a new Pasha installed as governor. In January 1791, a terrible plague raged in Cairo and elsewhere in Egypt, to which Ismail Bey and most of his family fell victims. Owing to the need for competent rulers, 
Ibrahim Bey and Morad Bey were sent for, and resumed their dual government. They were still in office in 1798 when Napoleon Bonaparte entered Egypt. The ostensible object of the French expedition to Egypt was to reinstate the authority of the sublime Porte and suppress the Mamluks, in the proclamation printed with the Arabic types brought from the propaganda press and issued shortly after the taking of Alexandria, Bonaparte declared that he revered God, the Prophet Muhammad, and the Quran far more than the Mamluks revered them, and argued that all men were equal except so far as they were distinguished by their intellectual and immoral excellences, of which the Mamluks had no great share. In the future, all posts in Egypt were to be open to all classes of the inhabitants. The conduct of affairs was to be committed to the men of talent, virtue, and learning, and to prove that the French were sincere Muslims, the overthrow of the papal authority in Rome was suggested. That there might be no doubt of the friendly feeling of the French to the Porti, villages and towns which capitulated to the invaders were required to hoist the flags of both the Porti and the French Republic, and in the thanksgiving prescribed to the Egyptians for their deliverance from the Mamluks. Prayer was to be offered for both the Sultan and the French army. It does not appear that the proclamation convinced many Egyptians of the truth of these professions. After the Battle of Mbebe, also commonly known as the Battle of the Pyramids, at which the forces of both Morad Bey and Ibrahim Bey were dispersed, the populace readily plundered the houses of the Beys. A deputation was sent from al Azhar to Bonaparte to ascertain his intentions. These proved to be a repetition of the terms of his proclamation, and, though the combination of loyalty to the French with loyalty to the Sultan was unintelligible, a good understanding was at first established between the invaders and the Egyptians. A municipal council was established in Cairo, consisting of persons taken from the ranks of the sheikhs, the Mamluks, and the French. Soon after, Delegates from Alexandria and other important towns were added. This council did little more than register the decrees of the French commander, who continued to exercise dictatorial power, the destruction of the French fleet at the Battle of the Nile, and the failure of the French forces sent to Upper Egypt, where they reached the first cataract, to obtain possession of the person of Morad Bey shook the faith of the Egyptians in their invincibility. In consequence of a series of unwelcome innovations, the relations between conquerors and conquered grew more strained daily, until at last, on the occasion of the introduction of a house tax on the 22nd of October 1798, an insurrection broke out in Cairo. The headquarters of the insurrection were in the University of Azar. On this occasion, the French General Dupuy, Lieutenant Governor of Cairo, was killed. The prompt measures of Bonaparte, aided by the arrival from Alexandria of General Jean-Baptiste Kleber, quickly suppressed this rising, but the stabling of French cavalry in the Mosque of Azar gave great and permanent offence. In consequence of this affair, the deliberative council was suppressed, but on 25 December a fresh proclamation was issued reconstituting the two divans which had been created by the Turks. The special divan was to consist of 14 persons chosen by a lot out of 60 government nominees and was to meet daily. The general divan was to consist of functionaries, and to meet on emergencies. In consequence of dispatches that reached Bonaparte on 3 January 1799, announcing the intention of the Porti to invade the country with the object of recovering it by force, Bonaparte resolved on his Syrian expedition, and appointed governors for Cairo, Alexandria, and Upper Egypt to govern during his absence. Defeat of the Turkish army, he returned from that ill-fated expedition at the beginning of June. Morad Bey and Ibrahim Bey had taken advantage of this opportunity to collect their forces and attempt a joint attack on Cairo, but Bonaparte arrived in time to defeat it. In the last week of July, he inflicted a crushing defeat on the Turkish army that had landed at Abka, aided by the British fleet commanded by Sir Sidney Smith. Shortly after his victory, Bonaparte left Egypt, having appointed Kleber to govern in his absence, which he informed the sheikhs of Cairo was not to last more than three months. Kleber regarded the condition of the French invaders as extremely perilous, and wrote to inform the French Republic of the facts. A double expedition was sent by the Porti shortly after Bonaparte's departure for the recovery of Egypt, one force being dispatched by sea to Damietta 
while another under Yausuf Pasha took the land route from Damascus by Al Arish. The first force had some success, in consequence of which the Turks agreed to a convention on the 24th of January 1800, by virtue of which the French were to quit Egypt. The Turkish troops advanced to Bilbao, where they were received by the sheikhs from Cairo. The Mamluks also returned to Cairo from their hiding places. Before the preparations for the departure of the French were completed, orders came to Smith from the British government forbidding the carrying out of the convention unless the French army were treated as prisoners of war. When these orders were communicated to Kleber, he cancelled the orders previously given to the troops and proceeded to put the country in a state of defence. His departure, with most of the army, to attack the Turks at Materia led to riots in Cairo, in the course of which many Christians were slaughtered. The National Party was unable to gain possession of the citadel, and Kleber, having defeated the Turks, was soon able to return to the capital. On 14 April he bombarded Bulak and proceeded to bombard Cairo itself, which was taken the following night. Order was soon restored, and a fine of 12 million francs was imposed upon the rioters. Morad Bey sought an interview with Kleber, and succeeded in obtaining the government of Upper Egypt from him. Morad Bey died shortly afterwards and was succeeded by Osman Bey al-Badizi. Assassination On 14 June, Kleber was assassinated by Suleiman of Aleppo said to have been incited to the deed by a Janissary refugee at Jerusalem, who had brought letters to the sheikhs of the Azhar. Although they gave him no support, three of the sheikhs were executed by the French as accessories before the fact. The assassin himself was tortured and impaled, despite the promise of a pardon if he named his associates. The command of the army then devolved on General J. F. Baranda, Menu, a man who had professed Islam and who endeavoured to conciliate the Muslim population by various measures, such as excluding all Christians, with the exception of one Frenchman, from the Divan, replacing Copts who were in government service with Muslims, and subjecting French residents to taxes. Whatever popularity might have been gained by these measures was counteracted by his declaration of a French protectorate over Egypt, which was to count as a French colony. In the first weeks of March 1801, the English under Sir Alf Abercrombie effected a landing at Abuka, and proceeded to invest Alexandria, where they were attacked by Menu. The French were repulsed, but the English commander was mortally wounded in the action. On the 25th, fresh Turkish reinforcements arrived with the fleet of the Kapudan Pasha Husein. A combined English and Turkish force was sent to take Rashid. On 30 May, General A.D. Billiard, the French commander in Cairo, was assailed on two sides by British forces under General John Hurley Hutchinson and Turks under Yusuf Pasha. After negotiations, Belliard agreed to evacuate Cairo and to sail with his 13,734 troops to France. On 30 August, Menu was compelled to accept similar conditions, and his force of 10,000 left Alexandria for Europe in September. This was the termination of the French occupation of Egypt. The chief permanent monument of the occupation was the description de l'Egypt, compiled by the French savants who accompanied the expedition. Soon after the French evacuated Egypt, the country became the scene of more severe troubles, a consequence of the Ottomans' attempts to destroy the power of the Mamluks. In defiance of promises to the British government, orders were transmitted from Constantinople to Husein Pasha to ensnare and put to death the principal Beys. According to the Egyptian contemporary historian Al-Jabati, they were invited to an entertainment on board the Turkish flagship and then attacked. However, Sir Robert Wilson and M. F. Manjin stated that they were fired upon in open boats in Abu Bay. They offered resistance, but were overpowered, and some killed. Others were made prisoners. Among the prisoners was Osman Bale Bardizi, who was severely wounded. The British General Hutchinson, informed of this treachery, immediately took threatening measures against the Turks, causing them to surrender the killed, wounded, and imprisoned Egyptians to him. At the same time, Yusuf Pasha arrested all the Beys in Cairo, but soon the British compelled him to release them. Khusrev Pasha was the first Ottoman governor of Egypt after the expulsion of the French. The form of government, however, was not the same as that before the French invasion, for the Mamluks were not reinstated. The Pasha, and through him the Sultan, 
repeatedly tried to either ensnare them or to beguile them into submission, these efforts failing, Khusrev took the field and a Turkish detachment 7,000 strong was dispatched against the Mamluks to Damana, whence they had descended from Upper Egypt, and was defeated by a small force under either al Alfi or his lieutenant al Bardizi. Their ammunition and guns fell into the hands of the Mamluks. This led to a long civil war between the Albanians, Mamluks, and Ottomans. Campaign against the Saudis, 1811-1818 Main article, Ottoman-Saudi War, acknowledging the sovereignty of the Ottoman Sultan and at his command, Muhammad Ali dispatched an army of 20,000 men, including 2,000 horses, under the command of his son Chusan, a youth of 16, against the Saudis in the Ottoman-Saudi War. By the end of 1811, Chusan had received reinforcements and captured Medina after a prolonged siege. He next took Jeddah and Mecca defeating the Saudi beyond the latter and capturing their general. After the death of the Saudi leader Saud, Muhammad Ali concluded a treaty with Saud's son and successor, Abdullah I in 1815. Tuzan returned to Egypt on hearing of the military revolt at Cairo, but died in 1816 at the early age of 20. Muhammad Ali, dissatisfied with the treaty concluded with the Saudis, and with the non-fulfillment of certain of its clauses, determined to send another army to Arabia. This expedition, under his eldest son Ibrahim Pasha, left in the autumn of 1816 and captured the Saudi capital of Diriyur in 1818. Reforms, 1808 to 1823. During Muhammad Ali's absence in Arabia his representative at Cairo had completed the confiscation, begun in 1808, of almost all the lands belonging to private individuals who were forced to accept instead inadequate pensions. By this revolutionary method of land nationalization Muhammad Ali became proprietor of nearly all the soil of Egypt. The Pasha also attempted to reorganize his troops on European lines, but this led to a formidable mutiny in Cairo. The revolt was reduced by presence to the chiefs of the insurgents and Muhammad Ali ordered that the sufferers by the disturbances should receive compensation from the treasury. The project of the Nizam Jidid, new system, was, in consequence of this mutiny, abandoned for a time. While Ibrahim was engaged in the Second Arabian Campaign the Pasha turned his attention to strengthening the Egyptian economy. He created state monopolies over the chief products of the country. He set up a number of factories and began digging in 1819 a new canal to Alexandria, called the Mahmudiya, after the reigning Sultan of Turkey. The old canal had long fallen into decay, and the necessity of a safe channel between Alexandria and the Nile was much felt. The conclusion in 1838 of a commercial treaty with Turkey, negotiated by Sir Henry Bulwer, Lord Darling, struck a death blow to the system of monopolies, though the application of the treaty to Egypt was delayed for some years. Another notable fact in the economic progress of the country was the development of the cultivation of cotton in the Delta in 1822 and onwards. The cotton grown previously had been brought from the Sudan by Maho Bay. By organizing the new industry, within a few years Muhammad Ali was able to extract considerable revenues. Efforts were made to promote education and the study of medicine. To European merchants, on whom he was dependent for the sale of his exports, Muhammad Ali showed much favor, and under his influence the port of Alexandria again rose into importance. It was also under Muhammad Ali's encouragement that the overland transit of goods from Europe to India via Egypt was resumed. Sultan Muhammad II was also planning reforms borrowed from the West, and Muhammad Ali, who had had plenty of opportunity of observing the superiority of European methods of warfare, was determined to anticipate the Sultan in the creation of a fleet and an army on European lines before the outbreak of the War of Greek Independence in 1821. He had already expended much time and energy in organizing a fleet and in training, under the supervision of French instructors, native officers and artificers. By 1823, he had succeeded in carrying out the reorganization of his army on European lines, the turbulent Turkish and Albanian elements being replaced by Sudanese and Felagan. The effectiveness of the new force was demonstrated in the suppression of an 1823 revolt of the Albanians in Cairo by six disciplined Sudanese regiments, 
after which Mehmet Ali was no more troubled with military mutinies. Invasion of Libya and Sudan, 1820. In 1820 Muhammad Ali gave orders to commence the conquest of eastern Libya. Ali's intentions for Sudan was to extend his rule southward, to capture the valuable caravan trade bound for the Red Sea, disperse Mamluks who have fled south and to secure the rich gold mines which he believed to exist in Senna. He also saw in the campaign a means of getting rid of his disaffected troops, and of obtaining a sufficient number of captives to form the nucleus of the new army. The forces destined for this service were led by Ismail, the youngest son of Muhammad Ali. They consisted of between 4,000 and 5,000 men being Turks and Arabs. They left Cairo in July 1820. Nubia did not put up much of a fight. The Shajia Arabs immediately beyond the province of Dongola were defeated. The remnant of the Mamluks dispersed, and Senna was destroyed. Although nominally part of the Ottoman Empire since 1554, between 1821 to 1841, Muhammad Ali, Pasha of Egypt, came to control Yemen and the Sahil with Zila included. After the Egyptians withdrew from the Yemeni seaboard in 1841, Hajj Ali Shermaki, a successful and ambitious Somali merchant, purchased from them executive rights over Zila. Shermaki's governorship had an instant effect on the city, as he maneuvered to monopolize as much of the regional trade as possible, with his sights set as far as Harar and the Ogden, modern-day Somali region of Ethiopia. In 1845, Shermaki deployed a few matchlock men to wrest control of neighboring Berbera from that town's then feuding Somali authorities. This alarmed the Emir of Hara, who, having already been at loggerheads with Shermaki over fiscal matters, was concerned about the ramifications that these movements might ultimately have on his own city's commerce. The Emir consequently urged Berbera's leaders to reconcile and mount a resistance against Shermaki's troops. Shermaki was later succeeded as governor of Zila by Abu Bakr Pasha, a local Afar statesman. In 1874-75, the Egyptians obtained a firman from the Ottomans by which they secured claims over the city. At the same time, the Egyptians received British recognition of their nominal jurisdiction as far east as Cape Gardafui. In actuality, However, Egypt had little authority over the interior and their period of rule on the coast was brief, lasting only a few years, 1874. When the Egyptian garrison in Harar was evacuated in 1885, Zila became caught up in the competition between the Taj, Arab-based French and the British for control of the strategic Gulf of Aden littoral. I am. Lewis mentions that by the end of 1885 Britain was preparing to resist an expected French landing at Zila. However, the two powers decided instead to turn to negotiations. Ahmad Revolt, 1824. In 1824 a native rebellion broke out in Upper Egypt headed by Ahmad, an inhabitant of al Salimiyur, a village situated a few miles above Thebes. He proclaimed himself a prophet and was soon followed by between 20,000 and 30,000 insurgents, mostly peasants, but some of them deserters from the Nizam jihad, for that force was yet in a half-organized state. The insurrection was crushed by Muhammad Ali, and about one-fourth of Ahmad's followers perished, but he himself escaped. The subsequent years saw an imposition of order across Egypt and Ali's new highly trained and disciplined forces spread across the nation. Ali's foresight in reforming his military forces was rewarded by the invitation of the Sultan to help him in the task of subduing the Greek insurgents, offering as reward the Pashaliks of the Moru and of Syria. In the autumn of 1824 a fleet of 60 Egyptian warships carrying a large force of 17,000 disciplined troops concentrated in Suda Bay, and, in the following March, with Ibrahim as commander-in-chief landed in the Mora, his naval superiority wrested from the Greeks the command of a great deal of the sea, on which the fate of the insurrection ultimately depended, while on land the Greek irregular bands, having largely soundly beaten the Portis troops, had finally met a worthy foe in Ibrahim's disciplined troops. The history of the events that led up to the Battle of Navarino. The withdrawal of the Egyptians from the Moro was ultimately due to the action of Admiral Sir Edward Codrington, 
who early in August 1828 appeared before Alexandria and induced the Pash to sign a convention undertaking to recall Ibrahim and his army. Ali went to war against the Sultan on pretext of chastising the ex-slave Abdullah, Pasha of Acre, for refusing to send back Egyptian fugitives from the effects of Muhammad Ali's reforms. The true reason was the refusal of Sultan Mehmed to hand over Syria according to agreement. For ten years from this date the relations of Sultan and Pasha remained in the forefront of the questions which agitated the diplomatic world. It was not only the very existence of the Ottoman Empire that seemed to be at stake, but Egypt itself had become more than ever an object of attention. To British statesmen especially, and in the issue of the struggle were involved the interests of the British Empire in the two routes to India by the Isthmus of Suez and the Valley of the Euphrates. Ibrahim, who once more commanded in his father's name, launched another brilliant campaign beginning with the storming of Acre on May 27, 1832, and culminating in the rout and capture of Rishid Pasha at Konya on December 21. Soon after he was blocked by the intervention of Russia, however, as the result of endless discussions between the representatives of the powers, the Porti and the Pasha, the Convention of Kitaia was signed on May 14, 1833 by which the Sultan agreed to bestow on Muhammad Ali the Pashalix of Syria, Damascus, Aleppo and Italy, together with the district of Adana. Muhammad Ali now ruled over a virtually independent empire, subject only to a moderate tribute, stretching from the Sudan to the Taurus Mountains. However the unsound foundations of his authority were not long in revealing themselves. Scarcely a year from the signing of the Convention of Qatar the application by Ibrahim of Egyptian methods of government, notably of the monopolies and conscription, had driven Syrians, Druze and Arabs, who had welcomed him as a deliverer, into revolt. The unrest was suppressed by Muhammad Ali in person, and the Syrians were terrorized. But their discontent encouraged the Sultan Mehmed to hope for revenge, and a renewal of the conflict was only staved off by the anxious efforts of the European powers. In the spring of 1839 the Sultan ordered his army, concentrated under Rishid in the border district of Bur on the Euphrates, to advance over the Syrian frontier. Ibrahim, seeing his flank menaced, attacked it at Netzib on 24 June. Once more, however, the Ottomans were utterly rooted. Six days later, before the news reached Constantinople, Muhammad died. Now, with the defeat of the Ottomans and the conquest of Syria, Muhammad Ali had reached the height of his power, controlling Egypt, the Sudan, and Syria. He saw the Ottoman armies collapse or fall into disorganization after their defeat in Syria, and it looked like the Middle East and Anatolia were his for the taking. With the Ottoman Empire at the feet of Muhammad Ali, the European powers were greatly alarmed and now put into action a plan that had been prepared to meet the contingency which had been long foreseen. Their intervention during the Oriental Crisis of 1840 was prompt, and they made short work of Muhammad Ali's armed forces. But the Western powers, the West had no intention of removing Ali and the block he placed on Ottoman power. Thus, though the peace treaty was harsh, it left the Muhammad Ali dynasty in power. End of Muhammad Ali's rule The government of the Pashalik of Egypt was made hereditary in the family of Muhammad Ali in 1841. Various restrictions were laid upon Muhammad Ali, emphasizing his position as vassal. He was forbidden to maintain a fleet and his army was not to exceed 18,000 men. The Pasha was no longer a figure in European politics but he continued to occupy himself with his improvements in Egypt. The long wars combined with a murren of cattle in 1842 and a destructive Nile flood. In 1843 there was a plague of locusts where whole villages were depopulated. In 1844-45 there was some improvement in the condition of the country as a result of financial reforms the Pasha executed. Muhammad Ali, who had been granted the honorary rank of Grand Vizier in 1842, paid a visit to Istanbul in 1846, where he became reconciled to his old enemy Khosrev Pasha, whom he had not seen since. He spared his life at Cairo in 1803. In 1847 Muhammad Ali laid the foundation stone of the great bridge across the Nile at the beginning of the Delta. Towards the end of 1847, the aged Pasha's previously sharp mind began to give way, 
and by the following June he was no longer capable of administering the government. In September 1848 Ibrahim was acknowledged by the Porti as ruler of the Pashalik, but he died in November. Muhammad Ali's successors On Ibrahim's death in November 1848 the government of Egypt fell to his nephew Abbas I, the son of Tuzan Abbasat. Abbas put an end to the system of commercial monopolies and during his reign the railway from Alexandria to Cairo was begun at the instigation of the British government. Opposed to European ways, Abbas lived in great seclusion. After a reign of less than six years he was murdered in July 1854 by two of his slaves. He was succeeded by his uncle Said Pasha, the favorite son of Muhammad Ali, who lacked the strength of mind or physical health needed to execute the beneficent projects which he conceived. He had a genuine regard for the welfare of the Fellahin, and a land law of 1858 secured for them an acknowledgement of freeholders against the crown. The Pasha was much under French influence, and in 1854 was induced to grant to the French engineer Ferdinand de Lesseps a concession for the construction of the Suez Canal. In January 1863 said Pasha died and was succeeded by his nephew Ismail, a son of Ibrahim Pasha. The reign of Ismail from 1863 to 1879, was for a while hailed as a new era into modern Egypt. He attempted vast schemes of reform, but these coupled with his personal extravagance led to bankruptcy, and the later part of his reign is historically important simply for its leading to European intervention in, and occupation of, Egypt. In 1866 his mail was granted by the Sultan of Firman obtained on condition of the increase of the tribute from £376,000 to £720,000. In the next year another Firman bestowed upon him the title of Khedive in lieu of that of Wali, marking the end of Egypt as an Ottoman province. Ismail ruled the Khedivate of Egypt until his deposition in 1879. His rule is closely connected to the building of the Suez Canal. On his accession, he refused to ratify the concessions to the canal company made by said, and the question was referred in 1864 to the arbitration of Napoleon III, who awarded £3,800,000 to the company as compensation for their losses. When the canal finally opened, Ismail held a festival of unprecedented scope, inviting dignitaries from around the world. These developments, together with the costly war against Yoann IV of Ethiopia, left Egypt in deep debt to the European powers. A national debt of over £100 million sterling, as opposed to three millions when he became viceroy, had been incurred by the Khedive, whose fundamental idea of liquidating his borrowings was to borrow at increased interest. When he could raise no more loans, he sold his Suez Canal shares, in 1875 to the British government for only £3,976,582. This was immediately followed by the beginning of foreign intervention. In December 1875, Stephen Cave was sent out by the British government to inquire into the finances of Egypt, and in April 1876 his report was published advising that in view of the waste and extravagance it was necessary for foreign powers to interfere in order to restore credit. The result was the establishment of the Castellar debt. This control of the country was unacceptable to many Egyptians, who united behind a disaffected Colonel Ahmed Urabi. The Urabi revolt consumed Egypt. With the country largely in the hands of Urabi, the British and French governments pressured the Ottoman Sultan Abdul Hamid II to depose his male pasha, and this was done on June 26, 1879. The more pliable Tufak Pasha, Ismail's son, was made his successor. A large military demonstration in September 1881 forced the Khedive Tufik to dismiss his prime minister. In April 1882 France and Great Britain sent warships to Alexandria to bolster the Khedive amidst a turbulent climate. Tawfiq moved to Alexandria for fear of his own safety as army officers led by Ahmed Urabi began to take control of the government. By June Egypt was in the hands of nationalists opposed to European domination of the country. A British naval bombardment of Alexandria had little effect on the opposition which led to the landing of a British expeditionary force at both ends of the Suez Canal in August 1882. The British succeeded in defeating the Egyptian army at Tel el Kebba in September. 
September and took control of the country putting Tawfiq back in control. The Khedivate of Egypt remained under British military occupation until the establishment of the British Protectorate of Egypt in 1914.